I'm going to take that third 91 inch rafter and I'm just going to I'm just going to set it in in place here for right now. It's not going to be mounted to anything yet. We need to do a, a couple other steps before we get to putting that up. So what I've done here next is I've taken two eight foot two by fours. I've cut them down to 93 inches and that's the length we're going to need. I need two of those and hooked onto the end with the tape measure. Marked a line at 10 inches and I'm going to put an X to the right and then I've come down and marked a line at 45 and 3 quarters inches and also a line at 47 and a quarter and I've, t I've taken the line down both sides too because we're going to we're going to need to use those as a gauge a little bit later and then the last line on there is at 83 inches and on this end I put the X on the left side we're going to end up having a rafter connect one on the outside, one's going to be here, one's going to be in the center that I just laid up in there, uh, in that in the box plane in the groove, and then another one here, and then we've got the end one on the outside there too. So this is going to be the low side and the high side end rafter. I went ahead and put two screws on each side of each line here. It's a lot easier to start these also when they're on the sawhorses. So to the right of my line on the X, about three quarters of an inch in, I put two screws here, two screws there. I did it in between my center marks also, two there, two there. And then to the left side of my 83 inch mark, three quarters of an inch left of the line, two there and two there. So one of those end rafters has been installed here I've got my 83 mark, my line to the left. That's going to match up with the outside rafter. And I put two screws in there. Should be flush on the top and the bottom with the one coming up. And then we've got the center one with the screws ready to go. And that's what the other 91 inch rafter is going to be connected to right under there. And out on the other side of the, you know, the outside rafter there. We've got it coming up and it, it meets on the right hand side of the 10. I got two screws in there also flush on the top and bottom. I've got the other side ready to go. What I've done here, I'm doing this by myself so it's a lot easier. I've just screwed a piece of scrap plywood or scrap siding onto the bottom of the one. Then I can, I can set that end in there while I put the other end together and screw it on. Works a lot easier. I'm not trying to hold the whole thing up. So that's going to get done just like the other side. Now that that lower end is screwed in place, and I did have to squeeze, I had to squeeze that wall in a little ways. It was probably sitting naturally, you know, somewhere over here. I had to push it over about an inch to make it line up. That's going to help the whole roof end up being square. And we put the plywood on top, that also you can tweak it a little bit more. But this is going to get you right in the ballpark. So I've got. Both, this is my 10 inch mark and the other one was 83, did it just like the other side. Now I've got these center screws in, I've laid the, the uh, center rafter through the notch out in the plywood here. I'm ready to put the screws in uh, from there. I gotta line it up a little bit yet before I do that. And took my piece of scrap siding, screwed it on the bottom over here so that it'll hold that center rafter up while I'm putting the screws in and getting it all fixed into place. All right, so I got that anchored on real well. It's okay if this sticks up a little bit on the inside there because if you follow the angle down, it'll hit this corner just right. So that's okay. I kind of did that intentionally. And for that, the bottom is going to be a little bit um, raised up a little bit under there too. But again, you have, a, you have this outside board is straight up and down. So if you look at it when the plywood sits on there, it'll sit nice and flat. The other end, I got that screwed into place as well. Two screws right on those, right in between those center marks, just like we wanted. This is a look from above. The only thing left I have to do as far as the rafters go is just put the two fly rafters out there on the very end. I'm now ready to put on the two fly rafters, so I've taken two more eight foot two by fours. I've hooked onto the end and marked them at 94 inches. Did my six degree angle on there again. 
for both of those, so I'll be cutting those at 6 degrees, and also the other end, it'll be 6 degrees, take, taken off each one from, from nothing, so the angles are both the same way on both ends again. I've also pre-drilled two holes about a three quarters of an inch in. These are going to get a two and a half inch screw to hold on to uh, the, 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 um, the end rafters that are already up there. This is a 530 seconds drill bit that I'm drilling these holes with. I might have mentioned earlier in the video series that that this was a maybe a 516th, but it's a 530 second. And that's what I've been using. These are two and a half inch screws too. I know I mentioned it earlier in the probably in the video for something else, but I've been using these to attach all the two by fours together too. Two and a half inch Torx bit. I think it's T25. I've now got the two end rafters in place. Flush on the end here, and I use that same piece of scrap material just to hold it up on the other end before I put the screws in so I don't have to try and hold the whole thing so it's flush on both ends. Both sides are done the same way. And there's another finished look of the top now that it's all the rafters are framed in. If you've been wondering at this point why we're eight feet wide on the bottom and we're only 94 inches instead of 96 inches on the sides. It's so that when you put steel on there, I'm gonna put OSB on top, and then I'm gonna put steel on top of that. Steel comes in three foot wide sheets, but you can buy it in eight foot lengths. So with an eight foot length of steel up there, you can get by with this. If it were exactly eight feet uh, on the roof, you'd have no room for a little overhang. So I've got it set up so you've basically got an inch uh, of overhang on your steel on both ends when you put that on. That's why that's 94 inches, but on the other way here on the bottom side, it's 96 inches. I've now gone ahead and made the door header, uh, header for the door on the door end, and that is a two by four, 47 inches long. On the inside, I've got one screw holding it into the corner stud. It's pushed up underneath the rafter. Same for the middle, spotted right up and on the other side too. Push it up, made sure that I've got it right on the edge on the seam there. The inside opening from the corner stud to corner stud is 44 inches. Then I've got an inch and a half for each corner stud before it starts angling back. So that's why that header is 47 inches long. Two screws in there for now holding it up. At this point I'm going to go ahead and make a door. I'm going to make it out of plywood. Uh, if you've got your own residential door, this is where you might want to veer off and do your own framing and fit that in there. You'd be able to close your door slab against this and make a frame on this outside wall for that somehow. But since uh, you may not have one, I'm going to show you how to make one out of plywood. And the door size for my plywood, you don't probably need to cut it at this moment, but I'm 31 inches wide and 81 and a half inches tall on this piece of plywood. This happens to be a piece that I had here from from a cutoff before and it's the size I made a door before and it works I thought it was a good size for a door it gives you enough headroom to get walk in the stand with a gun barrel point it up over your shoulder and it's wide enough if you've got decent sized shoulders you're still gonna have a 30 inch or 29 inch opening to get it out of there you don't need to turn sideways and squeeze or duck down it's gonna be just the right size for that in order to frame out this door I'm gonna come from the Edge of the corner stud, I'm going to make a mark at seven and a half inches, mark an X on the left side. And on top, I did the same thing. I came in from the corner stud, made a mark at seven and a half inches, marked it on the inside. Also did that on the floor, seven and a half, mark it on the inside. Down here, came out seven and a half, marked it on the, on the right side. The opening then should be 29 inches if you've Got your measurements all right from line to line. It should be 29 inches. And I end up cutting a two by four for this, this uh, edge of the door frame, 84 and 1 8 inches. The reason I'm using a two by four on this side, it's gonna be my hinged side for the door. And I want a little more backbone for those hinges. Two by two isn't quite enough to get all the screws in there. The other side of the door, however, with the latch side, this is just a, one and a half by one and a half. I took my two by four and ripped it inch and a half wide. Got my one screw in the top there. It's gonna go right at seven and a half like that. 
And the bottom is going to be fixed right on the X at the 7.5 inch mark there as well. That inch and a half, inch and a half door latch side is now fastened with one screw. On the inside, <clears throat> I ended up putting some corner brackets in there too. I got my 7.5 inch mark right there. This is a hold it in place for now. I also did that to those corners. I don't think I mentioned it earlier in this video that I did that. Uh, you know, it's kind of secure already from when you screw the plywood into the base out there. But I did that just for a little extra support since this is the door side and it gets moved around a little bit. I also put a corner bracket on the 2x4, the hinge, the hinge stud there, and then also on that uh, corner stud for the window a little earlier. This one here probably might not be a necessary step. And we're going to strengthen these up some more too. When the plywood comes down the outside right here, it's going to come down right over this and you'll be able to, to secure it with screws there and on the base below. So that'll strengthen it up as well. So right now your opening is 29 inches wide. And after throwing in another 29 inch 2x4 piece inside there to fill it so it's flush, we are about 77 inches high from the bottom of our double header to the floor. I'm going to put a piece of plywood filler in above the door next. Now you should have a 12 inch by 48 inch piece of plywood left over from the short wall. We cut that much off the short wall. I've been hanging on to it ever since. First I just uh, just put it against the door frame here, slid it up, marked each side of my center stud, took it back down, put a mark at three and a half inches down, cut it out with my jigsaw. I've now slipped it back up in there and it fits pretty well around that. I put two temporary screws in here too. Uh, so that I can mark the door from the inside. But before I set these temporary screws in there, I wanted to make sure that I'm flush with the other piece of corner plywood here. So th those two corners should be flush on top there. And same goes for the other side. These should also be flush right there. And, and if, you're, if you've got your opening right, you know, your, both of your plywood seams are going to go tight right against the inside corner there. You're going to have you know, the quarter inch gap on the outside like normal, but the inside should be tight to the inside piece of the other corner of the plywood there. Now that that's up in there with my temporary screws, I've just taken my Sharpie and I've marked out the door so I know how to, where I need to cut my door opening out. So I'm going to pull that back off and cut that out. So that door opening has been cut out of that piece of plywood. The plywood has been fastened into place. I've paid attention to make sure I'm flush on the top of the corners going around the corner with the other piece of plywood. Uh, I'm not going to use I've used the wafer head screws like I did on all of the other uh, plywood pieces, but here around the door opening, I'm going to use countersunk. And the reason I'm using countersunk going around the door opening is the door is going to have a, it's going to lip over the top of this little bit. I don't want those wafer head screws sticking up and creating a void for air gaps and air leaks in there. So at least around the door frame, I'm just using countersunk screws. Remember those two 14 inch wide pieces of plywood we have left over from before? Well, that's what I'm going to use to come down the sides, uh, both sides of the door here. And so I'm going to take these 14 inch pieces wide, 14 inch wide pieces, cut them, rip them to nine and a half inches wide, and then cut them seven, eight and a quarter inches long, both of them. That's the same for each side, and I'm going to put those on. Well, those side pieces of plywood have been ripped and cut the length and install the screws. Make sure to put a couple of extra screws in down there. Uh, this is where your two by four comes down, so you add strength right there. Same the other side, make sure you get a couple below that uh, one by one and a half by one and a half there, just for extra support. One last piece of plywood that I need to put on is the piece to fill in below the door right here, and that's six inches high, 29 inches wide, and that'll come flush right to the top of the, of the floorboard there. Now to explain the door dimensions, <clears throat> the door itself, the plywood, 31 inches wide by 80 inches high. And I've got a 2x4 on the hinged side, so the bottom of the door is here, top of the door will be that end. I've got three 2x2s, or one and a half, one and a half going across, three different directions, one on the inside that's going to be the latch side. So on the bottom, I want to leave one and a half inches of overhang. A half inch of this will be forgiveness inside the door so we don't get any rubbing on the frame when it closes. The hinge side I'm going to leave one inch of overhang. 
And we're going to have an eighth inch of forgiveness on the hinge side in between the frame and, and uh, this 2x4 here. There's a 2x4 on this side, so we've got more room to, more backbone for the hinge when it goes on the front. Otherwise, we could just do it with 2x2, two two, but I want to make sure I've got three screws from those hinges in that 2x4. So an inch gap here on the hinge side. And this 2x4 is actually 72 and a half inches long. And what I want to do for the top is I hooked onto the bottom of the plywood corner down there and set my mark at 77 inches, and that's going to be the top of the inside of the frame here. So this is a 72 and a half inch 2x4, and on top I've got a 27 and 1 8 inch 2x2. Two and I need two of those, one for the top and one for the bottom. I've got this on the inside. And then this outside uh, two by two is 75 and one half inches long. And that, is all, that also comes down uh, to, the, to the bottom side, to my inch and a half mark here. So on the, on the hinge side, the overlap is gonna be somewhere around an inch and a half, maybe an inch and three quarters. But what I did is hooked onto the plywood here, came over 29 and 5 eighths, and that's where I've got the the uh, edge of this of this two by two set. I ended up you know marking both ends at 29 and 5 8 snap a line. I want to get those you know it helps to get those nice and straight. And then the inside cross member it's 23 and a half inches and it goes in between the two by two and the two by four. Whereas the bottom the uh, the two by two you know seamed on the inside here but was on the bottom of this two by four. And the reason I did that is so that I could get a couple of extra screws in there uh, to strengthen it for good measure. I also put on the ends of the of the cross members here. I put one, put one screw. I also I pre-drilled that with a five thirty second five thirty seconds inch bit too, so I didn't split those when I did them. So that is the construction of the door explained. I'll have around somewhere around three inches on the top left over. It doesn't really matter as long as I left you know a little forgiveness in here too, so I'm not hitting the frame, which I did. So my my inside frame is going to be you know definitely smaller than the actual door frame so I don't have any friction when I'm opening and closing it. I'm gonna share with you a few pointers I learned about installing hinges. I don't like it when they squeak. I don't like it when there's torsion on them. I want the door to open and close in a smooth fashion. So I've kinda of got a way to do this that I think helps you get them on there straight and true so you eliminate those problems. So the first thing I did, well, I got three hinges here. There's three of them in all. Got these at the home center. They're four and a quarter inches wide here on the wide part. They're for a gate or something. I'm not even sure. Some kind of an external hinge. Uh, you can buy them painted black, galvanized, or non-galvanized. I would recommend getting galvanized or painted. They have a nylon bushing. It's kind of hard to see, but right in there, so it helps eliminate squeaks, too. That's one of the things I really like about them. When installing these, I'm going to do the top and bottom hinge first. This is the bottom of the door. That's the top up there. Not that it really matters here, but... I made sure I'm doing the hinge side with my one inch lip, not the one with the uh, you know inch and a half lip. You don't want to get that wrong. And I got the, it's a two by four under there for for um, backbone. So I came up five inches, made a mark. Same with the top, came down five inches, made a mark. So I got this sitting right at five inches. It doesn't need to be five, but it seemed about right. You just put the hinge on there. You have this folded down basically at a 45. I'm sorry, at a 90, and then mark that center hole. I pre-drilled it with a 1 8 inch drill bit and then ran my screw in. I'm only going to do one there now. And then same thing on the other end. Just folded that hinge down, marked my hole, pre-drilled it, put the screw in, got it into a lot of that right in the center of that 2 by 4 on the other side. And then after I had the top and bottom hinge on, I snapped a line, I hooked it and made a snapped a line right across the edge of the hinge there. Made sure I got them bolts from, from one end to the other. And then I put the middle hinge on and I use that line as a gauge. If you've cut your door, if it's a factory edge of the plywood, you're probably okay. But if you use a skill saw and you have maybe an eighth inch of waiver, it's going to have that, that middle hinge is going to be tweaked if you did it like the top and bottom. So this gives you a reference point for putting that hinge in and out. It gets you exact. So all three hinges are exact. It's going to work better that way. And then after I get just the one screw in there, you know, even with one screw, you could be tweaked a little bit like that. So I take a straight edge, and I just go go between between two hinges, set it on the bottom, and then come up to the middle hinge, and I can straighten it out, get that just absolutely perfect 
with no, there should be no gap in there at all. Just like so. And then same with the other end. Now I'm ready to pre-drill these other two holes and run screws in them. I'm going to pre-drill them so I can get that hole right in the center. Because if you run a screw in there and the hardness of the plywood runs that screw off to one side or up and down, it's going to tweak that hinge and then it's not straight. So it's something I've learned, a kind of a way to get those really exactly straight. I think that's important if you want your door to operate smoothly and quietly. I ended up putting three screws in, in all in each of those hinges. Not not screws in these two outside holes. There's no two by four backer under there. And so I got three screws in there that are inch long. They're pretty stout. You know, those holes are pre-drilled. I think that's going to hold it just fine. Those hinges, by the way, were about five bucks a piece at the home center. So for 15 bucks, you have all three of your hinges. I'm going to go ahead and get the door opening ready to set the door in there, at least temporarily. I put a half inch piece of OSB down there, kind of flush to the edge here. Put a screw in it so it doesn't slide back on me when I set the door in there. That's gonna give me that half inch gap or forgiveness on the bottom. And then on the hinge side, I, I have three, one, they're eighth inch thick shims. I put three of those on there, just put a little panel nail on there. Did one about in the area where each of the three hinges are gonna go. So that gives me my eighth inch gap on the hinge side. Got the door setting in place. It's resting on that half inch piece of OSB on the bottom. I've got the back kicked over so that we're against our 1 8 inch shims on the hinge side. The top has a little rock in it though, so I'm gonna push it back to the hinge side and then run a temporary screw in there just to hold it in place so that I've got my eighth inch gap even on that hinge side all the way up and down. I got that temporary screw in place just to hold that hinge side tight against all three of those eighth inch shims on the hinge wall. Next I'm going to take a sharpie and I'm going to mark all the way along here. I'm going to mark the top corner of the door coming down. Just mark it all the way, at least, especially by, you know, in my hinge area there. All the way down and around. Another thing I'm going to mark too is just the, the top and bottom of each hinge and even the back. It's going to give me a reference for my hinge, hinge spacer blocks here. Then I'm going to take that door back off. Next I took some of the uh, three quarter inch treated plywood that I had left over from the from the floorboard there and I made three blocks four and three quarter inches wide by eight inches why that number well it's bigger than the hinge that's all it really needs to be and I mounted them up on the wall where the hinges are gonna go and so that's why we made the mark with the sharpie I'm gonna put a block on there I'm gonna center it center it let me back up a little bit here centered on the in the hinge so I got about the same amount of, of distance above and below I'm gonna slide it over about an, leave an eighth inch gap from that sharpie line on the edge of the door so we don't have any friction from the from this block in the in the edge of the door leave an eighth inch gap in there and then I'm going to screw it on there just like I did the two uh, one on the top and the one on the bottom the reason I'm using these three quarter inch thick blocks instead of a half inch block in there or spacer is because we're going to end up putting in this quarter inch thick foam tape it's actually going to be stuck to the door and so when I take the quarter inch thickness of that foam tape and then the half inch thickness of the door, it's going to provide a kind of an airtight bug proof seal all the way around that door. So I put the door back into the frame, push it against the hinge side, set my temporary screw to hold it tight against the hinge wall. Put two screws in each hinge here after I had, you know, had it pre, I pre-drilled all my holes first. Um, did those two. I've got these, this one pre-drilled for the next. I'm using like a one and three quarter inch construction screw with the Torx, you know, Torx bit to install it. And that's, gets me all the way into that uh, two by four backer on the other side. I'll go ahead and remove the temporary screw and take the, the floor, the uh, floor shim out, the half, half inch OSB, and then those one eighth inch th shims along the wall, and give it a try and see how it operates. 
Okay, temporary screws off. The uh, shims have been removed, bottom and the sides. The door operates nice and smooth. Doesn't make a sound, it doesn't make a creak. I've got a quarter inch gap for my foam tape to stick on the inside of the door all the way around. You know, all I'm doing that, all I'm doing that all the way around on the door here, and then when I have a latch, it'll you know draw it tight. So once your door is closed on the inside, I've got oh, a three-quarter inch or so gap on the top, which is fine. I got probably a quarter inch, maybe three-eighths of an inch all the way down the side. I've got that half inch gap on the bottom. And then I'll have an eight and I have an eighth inch gap on the hinge side. So no friction when the door is opening and closing. It's exactly the way we want it. It is time to get the roof boards ready. So for that, I'm gonna need two four by eight sheets. I'm gonna use half inch OSB. It's a little cheaper than plywood. I'm going to end up putting steel on top of that. You could shingle it too, I guess. Um, but I I don't like having just a steel roof as the as steel only for the top uh, in a hunting blind. And I've hunted out of them before when it's just steel above me. And it's like an echo chamber. Every little time you bump something, it sounds like it creates an echo and the whole thing rattles and and it's it's just it's just noisy. So I'd rather spend the extra, you know, 20, 30 bucks, put some OSB on there before I put the steel on there, just to basically deaden the sound. And I'll take that one step further. You know, I would normally paint this OSB on the bottom side before I put it on the roof, but since it's still cold in winter and I can't paint, I'm gonna put on some landscape fabric. It's actually called Yardworks Duro web weed control landscape fabric three foot by 50 foot roll it's kind of a cloth and that'll so that'll darken the uh, ceiling on the inside and it'll also help deaden the sound so i'm going to put that on the bottom of my osb sheet so i'm just going to staple it on there with the uh little t50 arrow stapler there and and then we'll flop them upside down on the roof. So I got one full four by eight sheet of plywood going on the roof. The other one is a, it's eight feet. I didn't I didn't cut it for length. That's good, um, but I ended up cutting it uh, for width at forty five and five eighths uh, because we took a little off so that we're just a little under eight feet. So we've got room for overhang on that steel. So that's why that one's forty five and five eighths. The other one forty eight inches didn't cut anything. If you happen to have a roll or partial roll of roof felt or tar paper, that would also serve the purpose here. Uh, that roll of landscape fabric was, I think, like 18 or 19 bucks. I'll get two two box blind ceilings out of that one roll. So for 10 bucks uh, a blind, that's okay. If I had a partial roll of of that roof felt, I probably would have used that instead, but I didn't. So I ended up going with this fabric. I've got the one sheet of plywood on the roof that had the felt attached to the bottom so from the inside that's what it looks like it makes a real nice dark ceiling I'll have to end up painting those rafters a little bit later on but it helps a lot I don't like painting overhead so once I got up on top here I was able to see that the the roof system is a little out of square which is not a surprise I mean I didn't do anything to square it up yet at this point so what I did is I got it, I got my plywood or OSB here flush with the outside. I got it flush and straight with the bottom. And I ran my screws in along this, along this um, outside raft here, all along the bottom so it's secure. I didn't run any up any of the sides. And I had to put a couple of eye hooks in each corner, one in this corner and one in the far corner. And I've got a ratchet strap. And I'm just going to tighten it until that plywood lines up and I've got the roof square and ready that right about there is where it looks good I want it to be flush here and I'm gonna go check the other side and make it make sure it's flush and if it is I'm gonna screw the whole thing down and then it's secure and square so I got those eye bolts out I got the other piece of uh, roof sheathing wrapped with the felt on the bottom side stapled up I got up there screwed on all the way around. It's nice and straight with both of my fly rafters on both sides. Nothing hanging over here, so if I want to put roof edge on and shingle it, it's good to go that way, all the way around actually. No plywood overhanging anywhere. The front, nice and flush too. Another look from the inside. 
all black up there with the felt on it. Even the overhangs around the outside are dark. Not that that really matters, but that's what it looks like. All, all the sheathing is on. There is one more 2x2 two two on the short wall on the inside here. This wall would, you know, have the ability, the plywood would have the ability to move in and out a little bit up there if I hadn't done something like that. So I just put it right under three under the three rafters here. I ran five screws in from the other side through the plywood. And I'll probably put one screw up through the center rafter because that one still was kind of kind of floating, you know, back and forth through that. Just kind of ran through that notch. It wasn't really fastened anywhere, so I'll just put one screw in there. Those end ones, not so much. They're already anchored to the corner studs. For the roof, I started with the low side. I've got an eight foot piece of roof edge on the bottom there. And then after that, I'm gonna put the roof felt or synthetic roof material on top of that so that it's over the roof edge here. Once I get all that synthetic felt on there, I'm gonna do the sides with the roof edge so that, that the sides actually sit on top of the, the roof felt. So there it is with all the felt on and all of the roof edge on both sides on there as well. Now you could put your steel on there and then a corner that's a steel corner that's specifically made for that. It's kind of expensive. I think it's like 15 maybe dollars a piece for an eight footer. It's like it's called a rake corner. Found roof edge to be cheaper. Uh, and it works just as fine for a deer stand. If you're building a nice pole shed, well then maybe you'd want to consider that. On the top side, we're gonna end up sliding the tin underneath this piece of trim for steel. I'm not sure what this is called, but it's, I don't think it's a J trim. It's actually used for the base. When you, when you put it on a pole shed, then the steel sits on top of that. This is the bottom piece, but I actually screw it into the face up here so that I can slide the roof tin right underneath it. And that kind of creates a, you know, the water won't get down and underneath your roof line there. So when I put that on, I just use a three quarter inch board here as a gauge so that I could get it at the right height. When I screwed it on the outside, I think I used, I don't know, about six of the screws made for the steel roofing there on there to hold that up. And then I'll just tuck that steel right up underneath there and it'll hopefully be waterproof. I've got the three pieces of steel laid out for the roof. They are eight feet long. I've got them offset just for visual reference here. And in order to get a nice edge to screw on on the roof, I've actually started by taking four inches off the left piece and I just use a utility knife and I score, give it a hard score right along the rib there, flip the sheet over, fold it in half and it, and it breaks right on the cut. It's kind of a nice easy way. I wear gloves though, otherwise you'll end up bleeding no matter what. So four inches off the beginning of the first piece, I lap the second piece on top of that, I lap the third piece on top of the second piece with the rib, and then the end of the third piece I cut off seven and one half inches the same way. So I will also have, hopefully, a screw line somewhere on there. I didn't want to have a rib right on the outside where it's overhanging. I wanted the overhang to have a nice flat lip out there, especially since I'm not using those those rake corners. So three pieces of steel here. I think they were 20 bucks a piece, so 60 bucks for the roof, roof metal. Might have failed to mention that I cut those so that there's an inch or so of overhang on both sides. So now I've got a nice flat area here to screw into on that outside rafter. I'm not going to be on trying to screw through the ribs with the screw. Got all three pieces up there. I got them pushed up underneath that, that lip on the top. Down on the end here, I also have about an inch of overhang going all the way up, so I'll be able to get screws in to my end rafter, my side rafters, and screws all the way in between. And on top, there it is, tucked underneath right there like that, so hopefully completely weatherproof, waterproof, and good to go. Now I'm framing out the corner windows. In order to do that, we want to take a, this is 12 and 7 eighths or just a little bit under. And I actually used a treated piece for the bottom here in case it does get water um, sitting on it. It'll last a little bit longer right there. So a little under 12 and 7 eighths, one on the bottom. This is an inch and a half by an inch and a half. One on the top, also an inch and a half by an inch and a half. They should be flush with your, the, your plywood there, the, the opening in the plywood. And I put three screws from the outside into each one of those. One about here, here, and here coming in from the other direction. And then the sides, this should be an inch and a quarter each way left over on, uh, on the inside lip of the window there. 
So I've taken uh, some, a two by six actually, cut it to 32, 32 and a half inches. And then I got four pieces that are an inch and a quarter wide when I ran it through the table saw. So an inch and a quarter this way, inch and a half that way. It's pretty much flush, even if it's a little bit sticking out over, that's okay, it's gonna work. And then what I ended up doing is running three screws in there uh, into the stud rather than put more screws from the outside. So this is what it looks like when it's finished. I got the piece on the bottom there. We've got the inch and a, inch and a quarter wide by inch and a half. That way, they're screwed in there. Three screws, one, two, and three, going into this corner stud here. So our opening uh, is 10 and a half by 32 and a half. That's what we want for when we install the plexiglass and the, and the, and the seal, the gasket that goes around that too. I've got all the windows cut out and framed in with two by twos or one and a half by one and a half. And we've got three big windows on the four foot walls, and we've got four of the taller, narrower windows. These windows are the, the actual window sheet is 10 inches wide by 32 inches high. The reason I made the windows the size as they did were there are several reasons, but this is quarter inch thick acrylic sheets, 20 inches wide by 32. If I rip that in half, I can get two 10 inch by 32 inch sheets for the you know, for the tall, narrow windows. So two sheets, I got four windows out of there, and then three more sheets make the bigger windows. So five sheets in all at 25 bucks, 125 bucks for the acrylic sheet all the way around. The rough opening for these taller, narrow windows, 10 and a half inches wide by 32 and a half inches high. The actual acrylic sheet will be 10 inches wide by 32 inches high. Going around on the inside, a couple different reasons again why I picked the sizes and why they are the way they are. Um, the side windows are 30 inches uh, wide and no wider because when the corner windows swing in, I don't want them getting in the way of the uh, side window when you want to open it and close it. So all of the windows can be opened interchangeably without binding with each other. So that's why these windows are no wider than 30 inches. I've got them 18 inches high because when I'm sitting down, I can still shoot a compound bow out of that window at a deer, unless the deer is standing, you know, like right below me. It still works for me. And it's short enough for kids to see out of if you got a kid hunting with you. Uh, and if you, you don't like the rest being that low, you can have a shooting stick. It just creates all kinds of options. Good with a crossbow. I just I just like it for that those reasons. And also the acrylic sheet, uh, you have to cut it down a little bit to fit in there, but it works uh, pretty good. One nice big open window gives you a lot of view of the outside. The, the, the bottom of all of the windows from the floor up, 49 and a half inches. The, uh, to the top ledge from the floor, 31 inches on the bigger windows. And then on the corner windows, I'm coming up from the floor 17 inches. And then again, 49 and a half inches to there. So that's the, those are the measurements, the heights of all the windows inside. The weather warmed up, so I've come a long way since the last video clip. I was able to get it outside. I painted the interior flat black. I solid color stained the exterior like a bark brown color. I wanted to get it all painted and stained up before I bothered with putting the windows in. So all the window panels and the window frames have been installed and I'm going to give you the quick version. If you want a 12 minute very detailed description of how I did these windows, I'll put a link in the description of this video on how to do that uh, on those windows in full detail. But here's the quick version. I've used this garage door stop as the exterior trim for the windows. It's got a rubber flap on it. And before I put it in there, I cut a half an inch of this rubber flap off of the door trim, door stop, so that it doesn't you know, it just creates more of an obstruction from the inside and the half inch lip of that rubber is plenty to do the job, you know, and make a good seal on the window here. So we'll jump to the inside. Okay, on the inside, I got my plexiglass or acrylic sheet. I end up putting three hinges on each, every sheet or every window. These are two inch hinges. They're uh, two bucks for a two pack. So three bucks per window for hinges, a buck a piece really. I installed them with the hinges. I get them on, got to get them on there real straight, but I used a 3 16 by 1 quarter inch aluminum pop rivet. Got one of those in each hole for the hinge, so six rivets holding that on. Screwed it to the, the once it's on the plexiglass or the acrylic sheet, I screwed it to the frame on the window. 
carefully leaving a quarter inch gap all the way around so it doesn't rub on that when it's when it closes. My closers are made out of one half inch PVC pipe, conduit pipe. Um, I just drill a hole down the middle and then there's a little washer back there behind so that it doesn't rub on the window frame when you turn it. It turns nice and smooth and I've got two of those on every window. So the the narrow corner walls, as you call it, they all swing in on hinges. I have the back two swinging towards the door. I've got the big windows that they swing down. They're pretty tall, so they just swing down out of the way. Uh, and then the two towards the front, this one swings to the right, that one swings to the left, and then of course one in the middle swings down, and same with that over here. Here's a look at that garage door stop from the inside. I know it's a little dark here, but the garage door stop rubber flap meets the window once the window gets closed. And then, of course, these the latches hold it in. But that garage door stop, I end up putting the bottom piece on first and then the top piece next. And then I did the two, here's a side window. Then I did the two side windows. These are like a cabinet screw. They're some kind of a wafer head cabinet screw that I use. You could use three penny galvanized nails or aluminum soffit nails or whatever. But I, again, I like to use screws because sometimes you don't always get it right the first time. It's a lot easier to take a screw out than a nail. So I put I don't know, four or five screws on the long run and, and three screws on every short run. Another thing that I did uh, actually from the outside, but you can see it better or just as good on the inside. I drilled a two and a quarter inch hole with a hole saw in the narrow and the corner, the corner walls on all, all four of them towards the top. And then what I'm going to do on the outside is take this aluminum soffit vent and actually buy a 16 inch piece of it. It's like two bucks and I just cut it right down the middle got three pieces out of one this is actually from another one so those will just end up getting screwed on right over those vent holes i like putting those four vent holes in there it helps a little bit with the with the moisture inside and the fog especially if you're running a heater it's nice to have a little bit of air flowing through up there to some extent another thing i did was got these door latches got them on amazon they were two latches for 24 bucks, I think so about 12 bucks a piece. I thought it made a pretty nice latch I just end up drilling a half inch hole right through the the one and a half here and uh, then you just Put the inside piece on there and it rotates also so it makes a real nice door closer. I did have to put a Sleeve on there just so that it doesn't slide in and out to make it work work right But yeah in, in the end it turned out pretty good for 12 bucks. I think it makes a nice latch and it's lockable So I like that also on the door, I put, it's called a multi-purpose sponge tape. It's a quarter inch thick and a half inch wide. And it's got sticky back on one side. And that just went on the door, all the way around on my door so that when I close the door, it makes for a, a better seal. And it's kind of a soft close. It doesn't make a, make a bunch of racket when the door actually makes contact with the wall and helps keep the bugs in the breeze out of there I guess so so a couple of the final steps here would be to basically caulk all the cracks and seams around the base I'm gonna do a layer up and around and over I screwed these back onto the triangular corners and I painted them and then you know you can make a a 45 degree trim piece for this but I'm just gonna fill it with um, some some caulking I don't know, for about three three tubes of caulk, the whole thing can be done, you know, basically everything. And they're like two bucks or $2.20 a tube. I think that's just a pretty easy way to go. I just fill that up with the clear, dries clear, goes in white. I'll probably go up around the edge too and do all that just to keep the spiders and, and the ladybugs and whatever, you know, critters out of there. And also around all the windows, I did, you know, I did a bead on top here already, but I haven't gone down the sides yet. So everything, everything that needs... Some caulking is going to get it, uh, even maybe up along here, just just to seal it all up. Got those vents in. I used six screws to hold those in. I did a couple of extra closers on the door here. There's a three-quarter inch shim, uh, just a piece of the old uh, flooring plywood left over there. So I did one on the top. Oh, I'll put it. I'll put some 
caulking in the seam on the plywood there too. I did two of those extra closers, so in the off season, I don't plan on really don't plan on keeping those during hunting season and dealing with all three levers. But during the off season, put a little extra, a little extra closing support on that door to keep it from warping and just to help keep it closed if it gets in a wind or whatever. I just think it's those are going to add a little bit more just to keep that door straight over time. I also dropped the carpeting in there. I did forget a couple of cuts, well, kind of after. The doorpost studs or whatever these are, I uh, didn't, I forgot, forgot those were going to be in there. So I had to cut around the 2x4 here and the 2x2 two two on the other side. And that's it, the finished product. Hope that helped you out. Maybe you want to make your windows smaller, maybe you want to make them bigger. But there's the 6x6 six six octagon box blind, start to finish. Thanks for watching.